Welcome to the American Chronicles podcast. I'm Vlad Vedjek. Autry Pruitt is the author of Planes, Stake, and Water, Defending Donald J. Trump, and worked as a Trump campaign surrogate during the election cycle. He is a board member of Americans for Fair Taxation, which is fairtax.org, and he hosts his own radio show on the Red State Radio Network. He joined the show to discuss his work on America's tax structure, the long-term prospects of the Trump administration, and how personal relationships, understanding, and forgiveness will begin to restore America. Coming up next on the American Chronicles. Autry Pruitt the author of Plain Steak and Water, Defending Donald J. Trump, is also with BelieveDonald.com, worked as a Trump campaign surrogate during the election cycle. He's a board member of Fairtax.org, and he hosts his own radio show on Radio Red State Radio Network. He joins us today on the American Chronicles. Autry, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me so much. I appreciate the invite. You, you've been actively involved in a lot of different things uh, in terms of politics, in terms of uh, policy. Uh, you, you're a board member of fairtax.org, and that's something that's really in the mindset of a lot of uh, members of Congress now, especially some of the newer members who are going to Washington, D.C. to really address these critical issues from the perspective of what needs to be done going forward to help the American people. Uh, mm-hmm. talk, to, talk to me a little bit about what you've done in, in your work for fairtax.org and, and what you see being the critical issues as far as taxation. Well, the, the thing I've concentrated the most on is trying to bridge the gap between uh, varied interests. So with tax policy, there's a belief that you have uh, individuals who are vulnerable in society such as uh, you know, certain minority populations, um, individuals that grow up in rural areas, et cetera, in one side of the tax policy. And then on the other side of the tax policy, you have uh, the wealthy and the well-to-do. And what I've been trying to do is bridge the gap and, and close those and basically get us to realize rather than not you're making – 25,000 a year, 60,000 a year, or 150,000 a year, that the tax interests are actually the same. Um, that's been the primary focus of my work with inside Americans for Fair Taxation, as well as reaching out and trying to change how, in particular, the African American community uh, is, is talked to or talked with about uh, tax. And the second question, the second answer to your second question is evasion is probably where we need to focus the most. I'm not Asian. I'm not talking about very rich people or pseudo rich people sitting in a room and <laughs> collaborating together, you know, yeah. to um, figure out how they can uh, avoid paying taxes. Twirling their mustaches. It's just. Why what did you say? I'm sorry. Why they, why they twirl their mustaches. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and what I'm talking about is the fact that recently I was reading an article of a couple of years ago where about 40% of uh, jobs in the next six years will end up being freelance jobs. 40% of working Americans are going to get half or a majority of their income from the 1099, or those of you who aren't familiar with 1099, let's call it freelance or independent working jobs. That means they'll have a main gig, and then they'll have a, a side gig where they, if they do a little bookkeeping, they'll do bookkeeping on the side, or maybe they make pastries in addition to their job right. uh, you know, delivering mail, and so they'll make pastries on the side. So with that, though, comes evasion. In other words... People all of a sudden, when the employer isn't withholding from their paychecks, all of a sudden they become much more conscious of what they're paying to the government. Yeah. And they're not as liable to report. In some cases, it's an outright evasion and it's intentional. But in a lot of cases, it's actually pretty minuscule evasion. Like you don't think about it, but if you go and you help a friend do some marketing, for example, for their company, and they pay you like 500 bucks. 
Uh, most people just pocket the 500 bucks and move along with their lives. They don't realize that the government says right now you need to send 150 of that to the feds. Right. So that's that's the biggest upset coming down the tax pipeline that politicians and individuals have to deal with. Well, you know, and I, I wanted to start with the taxation issue because that's the linchpin for everything. I mean, you uh, you've been doing a lot of work uh, in terms of your own political activity, your own political life. Um, in fact, your website mentions is that you, you you're dedicated to fostering a relationship between traditional and non traditional conservatives and removing the Democratic Party stranglehold on the African American vote. And the way the Democrat Party maintains that stranglehold is through manipulation of the tax system. They use uh, the taxes as a a stick and a carrot to force the issues and and force their agenda on these people. Um, that's correct. Let's explore that a little bit more more deeply. What 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 have you seen in in the recent past couple of administrations changing significantly with the new administration coming into Washington D.C.? Well, I, I think what uh, I've seen in 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 the past versus what's um, what's coming up is you have seen a big call to arms for redistribution. You've seen a huge notion of quote unquote fairness. Um, This is from the past in terms of, Oh, these people are making X amount of money and they're taking money from you. And that's why, why you're not making any money. You're not making any money because somebody else is paying less in taxes than what they should. When in in actuality, that has nothing to do with it. The economics of, how you make income versus the tax policy are two completely separate entities. They intersect, they bump each other, but they don't have anything to do with each other. But oftentimes when you listen to left rhetoric on the, uh, on the, on the left side of the aisle, you'll come away with this notion of, oh, the, you know, the banks are cheating, which I, which I talk about. You know, the banks are cheating, rich people are making more money, inequality, and the taxation isn't fair. And those are actually two separate questions. What moves the economy and gets your wages higher and gets you into better jobs is a different question than how much the government takes and, and whether or not they're taking that money and using it appropriately. I think in the incoming administration, more so having to do with Paul Ryan, and I believe it's Kevin Brady now, the chairman of the House Ways and Means Committee. Right. Um, that's the committee that deals with all tax bills for your listeners that may not know that. What's what's incoming is you're going to see a focus on user fees, more like you would see in Florida in the toll system or Texas in the toll system, uh, by which you're paying a series of tolls as you use the highways versus uh, having income tax, and then that money is proportioned out uh, amongst uh, legislative uh, bodies and committees as they see fit. Um, you're going to see a focus on user fees. I think what you're going to see is a focus on um, government waste, I think. And I'm not saying that President Obama and his current administration are charged up with the intention of wasting money. I think their view of it was, oh, well, we waste money, and that's just one of the things that happens when you're dealing with a large set of government, when you're dealing with so many employees and so many people. It's the effect of not running a business. So if you're on the right side of the aisle, which many people who run a small business are, or they lean to the right side of the aisle, particularly fiscally and economically, you understand that wasting money is not an option. But if you come from the what some call the faculty lounge class or academia, and you have always had this influx of money, influx of money, you keep building buildings and in, in, in bigger academic centers and endowing chairs, and you just keep getting money after money after money, then your concept of wasting money is different than if you're in a business. If you're in a business, you're trying to get to zero waste. Typically, if you're in government or academia, you're trying to get to acceptable amounts of waste. And I think that's going to be a big change with Trump. Trump uh, comes in and he wants a zero waste. Paul Ryan comes in and he wants to say, well, let's go to a user fee system, which has its own implications. Then I think the third thing with regards to tax policy is you may start to see more of a focus on um, 
maybe going towards a fair tax style system, which is consumption based tax policy, e a retail based sales tax. Right. We're speaking with Autry Pruitt. He is a he's an author, he's a radio host, political advocate. Um, he you can find his website at autrypruitt.com. dot com. You can also follow him on Twitter at Autry. You worked this past election cycle as a surrogate for the Trump Pence campaign. Um, that's, that's obviously that required something that required uh, a, a significant commitment of time and effort and, and uh, dedication. So when when did you when did you make the decision to uh, support endorse Donald Trump for president and and what were the what motivated you to become an actual surrogate for him? Well, there's there's two things. One, um, when he came out uh, when he came down the escalator. Uh, the stairs that day, and I watched his speech. And then Kevin Williamson came out with an article uh, titled Witless Eight um, <laughs> Rides Escalator. Uh, and then the media started to hit Donald Trump as, oh, he's a racist because of his um, Mexico statement. Uh, that's when my interest was peaked. My interest was peaked because any time a large group of establishment people decide all at once to go after somebody, it makes me give them probably a little more credence than I normally would have given them. For example, had this been a normal, had they reacted to Donald Trump normally, I don't know if I would have even uh, looked looked into him that much. Okay. Um, but not only did I look into him, I also had worked with the Trump organization just a little bit, not a lot, because I did real estate in New York City. I lived in New York City for years, a decade, maybe even more. And uh, I did real estate before I got into politics, and I had some run-ins, not with really Donald Trump himself, but with the Trump organization. Um, I represented African-American clients to them, and I never had an issue. Um, and in fact, in New York City, if you were doing a real estate deal and it, was, and it could work, if you're in commercial real estate and the deal could work, one of the things among African-Americans in real estate uh, you would find out quickly there is that people would tell you, oh, make sure you check out the Trump organization. Because with a lot of other organizations in New York City, headed by the way with so-called liberals or by so-called liberals, there was always the question of whether or not you were going to get a fair shake because of your race. But the Trump organization was well known to be very pragmatic. It didn't matter who you are, what color you are, if you had a good deal, uh, the Trump organization, you could get somebody there to at least listen to you. So I was very interested with that at first. I was very interested interested uh, with that in the beginning. And um, so when he came down the escalator, that's how I got in. Uh, that's how my interest was peaked. When people started writing articles so negatively, that's how my interest was peaked. And then I began to look at my libertarian roots, and I reached out to some libertarian friends and colleagues and some people I know within the Libertarian Party organization. And I was so uh, very, very disappointed by um, their reaction because I wanted to support a libertarian candidate. Uh, but I felt that we are now in a stage of big government and big bureaucracy. That's a fact. And it's going to take four years at least, maybe even six to eight years, to really begin to roll back big bureaucracy. It's like Obamacare. It took them a year to ram it down and pass it, and now they're talking about at least two to three years to completely overturn it, and even then they don't know how it's going to affect the system. By they, I mean the political class right. in general. So I began to look at it from a very pragmatic standpoint and say, you know what, we need someone that thinks completely different and that's used to making practical, on-the-ground decisions because that's what we haven't had. If you look at Obama's cabinet appointments, if you look at President Obama himself, most of them really didn't come from the real world of operating things, of being held, at least in the first term, for accountable, accountable for profits and losses, you know, to, 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 to having to look at sort of that bottom line every single day. And I just feel that in our bureaucracy, that's what we needed, because the facts are that although people like to say government is different than um, running a business, our government is so huge now that it is a business. 
We're speaking with Autry Pruitt about his work, uh, not only for his own radio show, but the work he did as a surrogate for Donald Trump during the campaign. How, how we, it, it's become pretty obvious that there was a, a somewhat of a disconnect between Trump and some of the different voting segments of the population. Um, yeah. you, you, you've done some work with regard to getting out awareness and understanding not only with African Americans, but with younger people as well on your show, uh, in your articles. So what do we do to bridge that gap going forward? Obviously we have an opportunity with the president like getting inaugurated in about 10 days now. Um, but Mm -hmm. going forward, he's going to have four to eight years of leading the country. He's going to have to address the concerns of, of all the citizens. And that includes people who didn't, vote for him, didn't support him. How does he bridge that gap? I, I believe the, the best way to bridge that gap is to begin to get results and then engage in a bit of theater and go out and tout those results. The only way you're going to really bridge that gap is to start getting results for people. So, for example, if it was me, right, and and let's say Trump engages in this carte blanche policy to increase wages, and let's say if you look at different community segments, uh, interest groups, as the Democrats do, so you look at African Americans, you look at Hispanics, you look at women, you look at LGBTQI, and across those groups in two years, Trump is able to see a 15% wage increase. He's able to see 2% of the country now makes minimum wage and lives on it. Let's say he can get that down to 1.25%, one and a quarter. He should then go out and say, hey, I know you don't like me. All right, I know you had your reservation, but let's look at some of the facts on the ground. The facts on the ground are in African-American communities. I've increased my policies and the, and the plans we've engaged in have increased wages by X percentage. Um, I know you were skeptical about the health care, but now we have this many covered, as many as Obama had, and you're covered cheaper, you've got a little bit more coverage because the competition has increased. I mean, I, I really believe it's an information campaign, and it's got to be done over and over and over again, up until the point, almost like the secret Trump vote, where people may not publicly Acknowledge that Trump is doing a good job because he still may be persona non grata in two to three years if Chuck Schumer has his way. Uh, but he will, that people in the privacy of their homes will say, you know what, I don't like what he said, but guess what? My wages are up. I see people painting again in my neighborhood. A couple new houses are going up. Blighted buildings are coming down, you know, et cetera. So I think if he can do that, um, get results. That's going to be the biggest way he can bridge um, that gap. Then the second biggest way is in the midst of getting results, putting a focus in on those communities, you know, when, where and when a problem arises. You know, so um, rather it's a, a police brutality issue that may come out or um, another civil rights issue or an issue with women or with gays or wherever, uh, visiting that community, being present, and coming up with outside of the box, I hate to use that phrase because it's overused, but outside of the box sort of Trump style solution. But I think, as I've said on my radio show, he has to put some Trump on it (laughs) in order to bridge that gap. Yeah, you know, I mean, and that's that's definitely something that he's going to have to start working on immediately. And he has even bigger challenges. He's got he's got extensive violence in some of these metropolitan areas like Chicago. Violence is increasing in New York City. Uh, we had that incident the other day where uh, this young man was abducted and tortured and uh, beaten yeah. for hours. How we have this ongoing situation where our there's there's a fundamental decay, fundamental weakness in our society that really needs to be addressed, and it, it's it's somewhat endemic to our culture to go through this cyclical uh, episodes where we where we 
where we go down into uh, really chaotic, uh, violent, uh, decayed society, and then we rise back up. Um, if we use your model as far as bringing economic vitality, uh, restoring jobs, uh, bringing a sense of purpose to a lot of people's lives, what, what do you think long term would be the prospects uh, for America and, and, and for society? I think long term we can see a resurgence of American leadership <clears throat> throughout the go- a globe, uh, and we can see sort of a re- – I shouldn't say a return to, but a new age of cultural respect. Uh, what I feel we lack now is what we lack now is a cohesiveness of all being American. Yeah. And a large part of that is because, and I've always believed this, and this gets into some of my philosophical beliefs about a nation state, but uh, uh, America is, as all nation states are, an idea. And that's where it begins. For that's why you can't pick up someone out of. Let me rephrase that. That's why we can't transplant American democracy over to other countries. Other countries have adopted our constitution, and it's never worked out for them in the past. Right. They've adopted sort of a democratized constitution, and it's never worked out for them in the past. Most countries end up with uh, having something work best for them that's closer to a parliamentary system, and that's because. There is an idea set that has to happen in the country um, in order for that country to succeed. And it's for any nation state. There has to be a – it's an intangible item. It's not a document. It's, not a, it's, an, it's the intangible consciousness of the country that has to exist. And America, despite some of the historical issues concerning women at the time and particularly African Americans at the time, Native Americans at the time, America on large part was founded with that consciousness. And what we're doing is we're moving away from that consciousness and sort of this into this free fall state that there's no binding America. And I believe that that's what we need. And so if Trump is able to succeed, if we're able to get to restore economic vitality then people that have, such as a lot of people in the millennial generation, for example, I'm from Generation X, so it's different, but a lot of people in the millennial generation, and sometimes I'm on the curb. I guess I was born in July of 1979, so some people say you're about six months away from being a millennial. That's but right at any rate, edge, yeah. um, it, that, the genera- that the millennial generation and the generation post them can see that the idea of America is what binds us together. And I know President, it's, it's curious to me because President Obama says, he, he said in, his, in one of his last uh, interviews he just gave, he talked about American, we're all Americans first, we're all on the same team. But I would submit to you, and I do this with a little bit of hesitation, but I would submit that nothing that the general left, I'm not going to talk about speaking President Obama, but I'm talking about his surrogates or people going out, nothing on the general left makes me believe that they think we're on the same team. Give you an example. Um, a conservative person, I, I haven't even heard of this, a conservative person I've never heard of refusing to help somebody on the side of the road because they have an I voted Obama sticker on the back. Yet that just recently happened. There was a Trump supporter, I believe she was in Ohio. She had an I voted for Trump sticker on the back. And the gentleman took a picture of her car, pulled over, took a picture of her car, posted on social media. It went viral saying, I'm not going to help you call your president because you support Trump. You can help yourself. Right. So and then to look at the number of people in the media who were agnostic about it or who said, oh, well, I get it. I understand it. Um, it forwarded this idea that, oh, you know, oh, we're not Americans. You're, you're not with us. We're not on the same team. And that's what we have to return to. So I believe if we can get to economic vitality, we can get a lot of people to believe that 
they're on Team America too, regardless of their political philosophy, left or right. That yeah. they're on Team America. It's always it's always struck and, me that that they talk a big game, but they don't actually follow through. Yeah, it's it, it's it's the case. They talk a big game, but they don't follow through. And it's also the fact that um, you've had a lot of you've even had a few conservatives in that camp where they seem to they seem to try to take Obama and place him into an unpatriotic category. You know, just because you've engaged in violate, violating the Constitution doesn't mean you're unpatriotic. I think of George W. Bush and the war powers through the USA Patriot Act, both one and two, right? I believe that he, as, as a conservative American constitutionalist, I believe President Bush overstepped his presidential authority in those wars and with regarding to prisoners of war, et cetera. However, um, I wouldn't say because he violated his authority, it doesn't mean he's unpatriotic. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the rhetoric we engage in with president Obama. Um, and then that rhetoric was up 10 times and engaged back in, uh, with us. So I believe is that if, if we can, if we can see a restoration of economics, it might be a little bit easier for people to see we're on the same side. Because when you're broke, busted, and disgusted, it's really hard to think that the opposite team isn't fundamentally in totality against you. Uh, but I don't know how much of that is to be true, to be honest with you. I, don't, I, I haven't quite settled it yet. I've got to wait for two years. But it could be that the America that I grew up with, um, sort of Democrats and Republicans, but it doesn't, didn't matter. You know, Democrats would date Republicans, Republicans would date Democrats. You disagree, but you can still go out for a drink. You still help somebody mow their lawn, that their political beliefs were secondary to the fact that we're all red-blooded Americans. Um, you know, the notion, you know, the notion, you heard about that school in California, right, that decided that on Cinco de Mayo Day, um, no one, they wouldn't fly the American flag and no yeah. one could wear the American flag. Yeah. I and only, I mean, I, I, you know, I was flabbergasted. You're in the United States of America and the school won't even fly the flag. Um, I've, I'm a couple years away, Vlad, but I'm going to be honest with you. I think that we, we could be in a situation where the America that I knew just a few years ago is done. And we'll know. We'll know in about two or three years. We'll, we'll know. Um, if the rhetoric continues like it has been, um, where it's obviously so one-sided, like this, these recent interviews with Jeff Sessions, right? Yeah. Uh, Jeff Sessions um, may have had some problems um, in, in the past and made some off-color jokes, but the notion that that rises to the level of racism like the former Senator Robert Byrd, right? Um, I think Bill Clinton or Hillary Clinton, one of the Clintons, called him the conscience of the Senate. For those of you that don't know, Robert Byrd was the grand wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He was a Democrat. He converted in the Senate, and then he was forgiven. He filibustered the civil rights legislation. <laughs> you know, the notion that we compare that somehow Jeff Sessions, uh, if he made, he didn't even he doesn't even say that he made it. But let's say he did make an off-color joke, and then an off-color joke one time is equated yeah. to. 20 or 30 years of actually being an organization of hatred, and you can forgive that, but yeah. you can't look at Jeff Sessions actually, and say, you know, the, it's just an off-color remark. The, it's the, preposterous the, the to grand me. I don't know if we can come back from that. Yeah, I mean, it, there, there's no equating it, but that's, uh, in reality, it seems like on a daily basis, that's really the, the, the forces that we're up against. We're up against, uh, we're up against people who are perfectly willing and able to equate a... Uh, an unfortunate, ill-timed joke with uh, a lifelong dedication to a racist organization and leadership therein. Um, it's it's troubling to say the least, but we, it, it's something that we have to deal with one way or another. Yeah, and I I just don't. I mean, the only the the one positive I could see about this, we could see a strong return to states' rights. 
we might actually see that start to happen. Because if we if we stay on this path and we don't become sort of all Americans again, and if we stay on this path, we're going to end up breaking up as a country. I mean, I, I, and I believe that could happen, actually. I'm only 37. So I actually believe that could happen in my lifetime, that we could actually end up seeing something that I thought would never happen, the United States becoming two separate countries, and maybe two separate countries with a plethora of agreements between them, but two separate countries nonetheless. I don't think it would happen via a war or via a revolution, but I think you might see a conference call. So I think in absence of that, we actually may see a strong return to states' rights, uh, to the notion of, uh, of federalism, and that could, you know, that could be end up being a positive. Um, we're to the place now where politics, I, I've never seen it where politics um, is actually breaking up people's friendships they've had for 20 years. That makes no sense to me. It's it's sad because I've actually had that happen to me where I've had somebody, you know, who's been a long term friend, long term acquaintance, and and it, it it the separation between the two sides, they're so committed to their side of the argument that your side of the argument they view as a as a fundamental. Uh, barrier to continue the relationship with you, and they that that the, the, there's no possibility for a relationship to continue. And it's better to just sever it at that point and move on. Um, and you see it a lot, especially with the prevalence of social media. Um, yeah, if 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 five members, Dylan Roof, who's in the sentencing phase of his trial right now, um, and I don't know if it was five, maybe it was four people, but killed nine folks. Four of those people came out, I, I believe it's four, that have come out, their families have come out and said because of their fundamental belief in Christianity, they don't believe it's the role of the state to execute people. Now, if someone can, ha if someone can forgive an actual racist who came in and for no reason, not, you can't even invent a reason, killed nine people in a church that welcomed him in, if those family members can forgive a person and still look them in the eye, even with pain, and say, I don't want you dead. But we can't look at someone who voted a certain way or who said, oh, I'm leaning towards Trump. And you can't say, but eh, forget it. We're still friends. We're going out. There's a, there's a huge problem. I, I don't think people have really put this and particularly white liberal America, I don't think they really put this into their thinking caps. You get people that can forgive actual murder. Yeah. And you have, and, and you, the white academic liberal, has freaked out because some people decided to vote for Donald Trump. There's that one guy in Dallas I just, who, uh, who normally hosts a holiday party at the end of the year, and he decided to go ahead and just cancel it this year because he's, doesn't want to have the possibility that one of the guests or more of the guests that he invites um, secretly or, or publicly voted for Trump. So he doesn't want the idea that somebody who voted for Trump is in his house. So rather than having that happen, he canceled the entire party. And uh, so what's, what's hilarious to me is that's not that happened with a best uh, one of my best friends. It's sort of similar that she had was throwing a party. And then she's planning out, she's planning out the menu, has a party every single year, invites the same number of people. She happens to support uh, Donald Trump. And uh, she ended up having to cancel because so many people canceled. And then they were sending Facebook messages and Twitter messages and emails to other people attending the party saying, how can you attend this? So she ended up having to cancel it because she was saying that she couldn't get a good count of how many people actually were going to attend. And she was afraid that she would throw the party because she doesn't charge anybody or anything. She spends a few thousand dollars on this party every year. And invite, they didn't even talk politics. They, nobody ever talks. People talk about, you know, they talk about sex. They talk about all sorts of entertainment. They never talk politics. And she had to cancel it because she was like, I couldn't get an accurate count. I got a bunch of maybes. 
and you know, and she wasn't going to spend you know five thousand dollars on a on a holiday party, which she saves up for diligently every single year because she doesn't have kids and her family's thin. So that's where she spends her money. She saves up and throws this huge party for friends. It's uh, it's almost an overnight party. It starts at like five p.m. and goes to two or three in the morning. And she decided I can't get a good count, so I can't get a band here and this here and and do all of this because I don't know. I mean, th- that's you know. It's so ironic, your story, because I literally had the same thing happen to me um, just a few weeks ago. Unbelievable. It's it's gotten to the point where our country, like you said, is, is very sharply divided. And um, in, a, in a very real way, our country is continuing to divide. You see uh, governments from various states refusing to do business with certain other states because of their policies. Or you see them enact policies within their own states that preclude the interaction with or doing business with other states uh, in an yeah. effort to achieve some 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 agenda or some goal. And especially, I think the most visible one has been like New York, where uh, the governor of New York basically said uh, that if you believe in pro life, if you believe in uh, uh, if you if you're uh, against expanding and changing the the traditional definition of marriage, then you have no place in New York and you shouldn't do business in New York. You should go somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> and then in California, you know, they're, they're always doing things where they're trying to legislate uh, out of existence our many of our fundamental rights and, and basically telling people, well, if you believe in the Second Amendment, you don't, you don't even bother coming to California. And so yeah. you, you have these sharp divisions that are are deepening and widening uh, in, increasingly, and and I don't doubt what that your analysis of it that th- these divisions are going to increase over time. I don't doubt that that's going to happen um, because as long as these extreme uh, political activists uh, who are dedicated to the prospect of of el- ending. The American experiment that 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 our our rights are derived from our Creator and do not come from government until they're removed from power until they no longer have a seat at the table, w- things are just going to get worse. Um, I guess yeah. I guess to wrap this up, what do you think our prospects are long term um, as far as addressing those challenges? I mean, short term, it's going to get a little bit worse because. Uh, the left has a really hard time accepting the fact that they lost the election, that the legacy of, of the president and uh, the secretary Clinton is going to be one of failure and that within 10 days, Donald J. Trump is going to sit in the white house and, and, and that agenda is going to take precedence. So in the short term, we're going to have much sharper divisions. We're going to have a lot of fights, a lot of uh, hurt feelings, but long term, there's, there's going to have to be a moment where we have to turn that corner um, what, what, what's your view on that? Well, I, I believe that the short term prospects are glim, grim, excuse me. And I believe that the long term prospects, truth be told, I'm, I don't have that much confidence in the long term prospects. Um, let me, let me, let me tell you why. Let's, let's just take the bill of rights. All right. Uh, let's take the commerce clause. We, for the longest period in our history, there was a fundamental agreement that they may not be as originalist or textualist as a Cruz or a Scalia, but there was a general agreement, even among liberal justices, that the ideals of the Constitution in general had to hold, just the general idea. There may be some tweaks, there may be some modifications, right, but like the Second Amendment. If you read Scalia's decision in Heller, which I read concerning the, the Second Amendment, I mean, it, it, is, it is right on the money. There's some times that it's like, ah, eh, maybe, but his decision in Heller is right on the money, that the Second Amendment did apply to individuals, and you can't look at it any other way. In fact, you can look at the history regarding uh, slavery and Jim Crow and see that the Second Amendment applied to individuals because states, when they were taking away Second Amendment rights for blacks, specifically spoke <laughs> that the Second Amendment applied to individuals. Everybody knew that. Um, 
And the problem is, is if you have entire states that don't buy into that concept, just like entire states didn't buy into the concept once the amendments were passed that African Americans were equal to white, whites, if you have entire states that don't buy in the concepts of your free speech, rather not I like it, is your free speech, and as long as it's not inciting a riot, it should be you should have it, or that your free press, like Breitbart, for example, is 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 free press, you should have it, or your gun is your gun, your Second Amendment rights, you should have it. If they don't buy into those Bill of Rights, we're we're dead from the get go. I mean, the, the problem, the, the fundamental issue, and the reason why I think things, and I don't mean to be, I don't mean your listeners to be so sad, uh, but the fundamental grimness is we're not talking the same language. I've gotten away from on my program, I don't even mention the Constitution that much. I've done a couple episodes where I've talked about the Declaration, but I don't even mention it. Because people that are on the opposite side of the aisle from me, that doesn't even mean anything to them. You know, yeah, that's that's what's happening. every once Donald Trump said something about uh, the banning the Muslims entering the country. Um, then you heard a few Democrats talk about the Constitution. So I I think the hope is grim. I really think the power, the only way we're going to come through this is personal relationships. Conservatives hear me well. The only way we're going to come through this is for you to do the opposite of what the left does. You have to consciously become friends with and reach out to people on the left side of the aisle. The LGBTQI community had this strategy, and it worked to a lot of extent, where if conservatives, if we recant and we go in our corners and we don't watch Meryl Streep anymore, we don't go to a movie theater because of their disgusting, we don't then... They don't get to know, by they I mean the left, the left doesn't get to know us as individuals. And that's the way we're going to conquer this. I don't believe we're going to conquer this through government policy and government rhetoric. I think the only way we're going to conquer it is to begin to change people's hearts by getting to know them. And that's going to be tougher. It's, it's going to be tougher. That sounds like you're saying we, should, we need to take back the culture. Yeah, I I I think so. I think we need to take when you, the answer to your question is yes, but I don't like using that term because it sets up sort of like a war, right? right. So the way I I phrase it is, we need to help everybody remember that we're still a part of the culture. We're still fifty percent of the culture. Maybe we're forty nine point eight percent, right? Because everybody likes to point out the popular vote. Right. So maybe we're forty nine point eight. But we're still roughly half of the culture. And so I think we're not really taking it back. We're raising our hands and saying, um, you know, Donald Trump used that phrase, silent majority. And it by large is true. I think before it was sort of just a coin term. Uh, but now it actually is true. You have conservatives that enjoy Star Wars and a Star Trek. You have conservatives that enjoy Las Vegas and New Orleans that – are more libertarian leading that enjoy a strip club or whatever, you know, and they're afraid to speak up as conservatives. That's, you know, that's why the pollsters could get it right with Donald Trump. Exactly. They're afraid to speak up. And they, so I think we're not really taking it back. We're letting them know we haven't gone anywhere. That's true. That's true. We need to, in a very real way, we need to take on the, uh, use this almost as a missionary project and actually go out and, uh, and, and, co-mingle with the rest of society Ooh, let them know that we're that's here. good let them know that we we're, we're Damn. people just like them and, and stole it from me <laughs> well i'll let you borrow it um you know we're, we're people too you know i i, I have i've gotten yeah. to the point where i don't interact with uh uh many of my family members uh with regard to politics i will comment on their pictures of their kids and their coffee runs and on their uh wedding photos and i will, I will say nice things I don't do politics with them anymore because it doesn't go anywhere. And, and if that's what I need to do on my end to keep good relations with my family, uh, then it, it helps on their end as well. Um, for, for a long time, you know, especially during 2016, you know, they looked at me as part of the enemy's camp. Um, 
we don't have those kinds of conversations anymore because n- both sides have decided we're not going to engage in that kind of uh, in that kind of vitriol. We're gonna we're gonna just try to focus on the positive because the relationship we have between each other is more valuable than than trying to prove that we're right politically. Um, and we've got that sentiment we need to spread, man. That's the sentiment that needs to spread, that the relationship we have as humans is more valuable than the political ideals that we have. That that relationship is, that's the most valuable relationship. It would never, this broke my heart. I mentioned that earlier. The notion that I would not, that I saw somebody stranded on the side of the road and that they had an I voted for Hillary sticker, and I wouldn't pull over to help them, and I would take a picture and tweet it out but not help them or at least not call somebody, even if I was uncomfortable for some reason. Yeah. I don't know why, but let's say I was, that I wouldn't pick up the phone and say I'm calling somebody. It was inside of that, and, and then when you publicly blast that out, that is vindictive. Yeah. That person... That was a black guy. His heart has hatred in it to see someone in need and take a picture, sprout their need, and publicly say, I'm not going to help them. Yeah. Imagine the opposite. Imagine somebody pulls up and they're driving a, uh, a car and they see somebody on the side of the road and they've got a uh, I voted for Hillary sticker and they pull up and they're helping them. And then the person who was stranded notices that there's a Trump pen sticker on the back of the other car. And I think that would go a long way towards maybe healing some of these rifts. Um, we've been speaking with Autry yeah. Pruitt. He's a he's a writer, a radio host, a political advocate. Uh, works for uh, Americans for Fair Taxation, trying to uh, restructure our tax uh, tax structure so that more Americans receive the benefit of their own work. Um, he he was a surrogate for the Trump Pence campaign in 2016, um, and he does a lot of things. He he's got he's got his irons in a lot of different fires. And uh, I really appreciate you joining us today on the show, Autry. Thank you for having me on American Chronicles. Thank you, Vlad, so much. I appreciate it. And um, I'm uh, hoping to engage and, and have you on the program sometime. It's 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 so important, though, what we're doing. And, uh, man, your thoughtfulness is amazing. Your, your, your thoughtfulness and commitment is amazing. It's hard. Sometimes I honestly just want to give up and go do something else. <laughs> <laughs> We've come too far. We've come too far. Yeah, right. Well, I appreciate you coming on, and, and definitely I'm, I, let's, let's get together again sometime soon. Okay, thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Thanks, Arch. Well, that brings us to the end of the show. Check out my website, vladdavidjuk.com, and make sure to follow me on Twitter, at vladdavidjuk. You'll love it every single day. Please give the show a great rating and review on iTunes. It really helps other people find us when they search for a really good show to listen to. Until the next time, remember, eternal vigilance is the price of liberty, and freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction.